We're glad that you've chosen to join us here at Woodcrest. We're happy to announce we will once again begin having two services on Sundays, starting on June 6th. We'll meet at 9 o'clock and 10.30. Please take note of that adjustment. The 11 o'clock service is moving to 10.30. We would love if you were able to help out by volunteering in Kidcrest or in the gym with our middle and high school kids. Just go to register.woodcrest.org to the Kidcrest volunteer application to sign up. Our staff will make serving fun and easy. You won't want to miss next weekend. During the service, we'll have the opportunity to celebrate communion together. Next weekend is also Memorial Weekend, and we invite you to hang out after the service. There will be food trucks available in the parking lot, so plan to stick around, grab some lunch, and let's have some fun together. Let's stand and sing as our band leads us this morning in worship together. Woodcrest, real people, real journey starts now.
train for the once forgotten to carry you to a heavenly light.
trust in you. The battle is yours. I will trust in you. And only you, Lord. I will trust in you. My God is faithful. He's always beside me. He's a mover of mountains. My God is mighty. My God is faithful. He's always beside me. Mover of mountains. My God is mighty. Lord, you are. Thank you so much for singing with us. Let's continue our time of worship together as we prepare our tithes and offerings. We have boxes available as you exit the service to place your offerings in, or if you prefer the simplicity of digital giving, you can text your offering amount to 77977 or go to the Woodcrest app and hit the Give button. When we pool our resources, we can collectively change lives and extend Christ's love to those around us. We invite you to be a part of that and are grateful for your participation and generosity. Today, we are thrilled to be joined again by Matt Gordon from Veterans United with today's message. Morning. Good morning. All right. Happy graduation. Those of you who graduated, some of you graduated college, some of you graduated a long time ago, some of you are waiting to graduate high school, some of you graduated fourth grade because we celebrate those now too. Uh, but it's all good. Those are all great milestones. And usually what comes with graduation is commencement. Like someone makes a commencement speech, or there's commencement thoughts even if there is no speech. So what I want to do today is kind of give a commencement of sorts. It might be more of a counter-commencement. It's going to go kind of against the grain of the commencement talks of the last 30 years or so. Uh, it's been said that you can tell a culture by its music. So if you listen to the songs of any culture throughout history, you can kind of tell what they're all about. And if you listen to like our Top 40 radio, uh, certain things like come into the context, okay? We're talking about like debauchery and individuality and sexuality. Like these are the themes. This is what our culture care about. So I think through music, actually what you actually get a glimpse of is a culture's vices. But it's by listening to commencement throughout the ages that you get a glimpse of a culture's virtues. Now the difference between virtues and vices oftentimes is just virtues or vices in better outfits. Like you just dress up your vices and they like can kind of sneak into people's thinking and then like they seem good, they seem pleasant, they seem pleasurable, but they also can be very destructive. And so with commencement, what you tend to hear is possibility, endless, infinite. There's this hopeful wish harboring that's going on during the commencement phase. And then the people giving commencement, they're just hoping that among the gathered flock, there sits a gates or a musk, or a rice, or a Steve Jobs, some bright light that can blaze across darkened skies and also bring endowment dollars later. Commencement is the beginning of a great, extraordinary, epic adventure, the dawning of a dream. And for some of us, it starts much earlier than, say, our like, high school graduation or whatever. It starts when we're little kids and we dream of being a sports star, or we think about rock and roll fame. I remember my sister, she had this dream growing up. Uh, she wanted to be a dish rag. And that's what she'd say. And my dad, he has a PhD and a bunch of other degrees, and he's somewhat ambitious, and he understands finance. And so when well-intentioned adults would ask my sister what she wanted to be when she grew up, and she as a seven-year-old would say, a dish rag, 
This was not okay with my father. And at some point he sat her down and said, hey, you can't be a dish rag anymore. It's embarrassing me. You have to choose something better. And so my sister went away and I don't know what a seven-year-old does to go away and get her thoughts right. And she came back with a, a decision, a direction. And so she was much like the high schooler declaring where she's going to college or LeBron saying he's taking his talents to South Beach. She sat there under the white hot lights of our family and said, okay, I recant my vision for being a dish rag. I choose instead to be a hot dog. (laughs) And that was our reaction. That was not my dad's reaction. He didn't laugh. He's like, you can't be a hot dog. The reason you can't be a dish rag is the same reason you can't be a hot dog. One, it's impossible. And two, it's unvaluable. But what we tend to do is we'll allow the former an impossible dream as long as you have the latter. It's valuable. That's what commencement's all about. That's what dreams are all about these days. That's what direction is all about. It's about choosing something that's huge, choosing something of scope, choosing something that has value. This is why early on in life, we realize that when adults ask us what we want to be when we grow up, just give them the answer that they want. Doctor, lawyer, pop star, anything. As long as it's super valuable, then they'll let you be. Like, just say the thing that they want to hear. So commencement speeches shout, and the same thing echoes in our heart, this intrinsic and extrinsic longing to be something that matters. And so what we have to consider is what matters. Like, in our cultural context, what matters? Well, I think three things stand to the forefront of what we put value on, what really matters to us as a people, collectively, especially in our nation. The first one is wealth. We are willing to be miserable for the money. It truly is all about the Benjamins. We are a work-obsessed culture. They do happiness surveys and unhappiness surveys, and the the countries that fall on the unhappiness scale more than any others are the ones that are work-obsessed. Like We aren't happy, but as long as we're rich, it's okay. Get rich and die trying is kind of the mantra of our age. Even this term, side hustle, Like one job isn't enough for most of us. We have to have two. We have to have three. And there's nothing wrong with side hustle. I'm doing it right now. I don't work here. I'm just up here speaking. This is a side thing because one job's not enough. We want to cling to other things and have more things going on. I think a lot of times someone was saying me earlier, like I asked him how he was doing and he actually gave me an honest answer. He goes, I know I'm supposed to say good. And I think the reason we say good when anyone asks us how we're doing is because it's one syllable. We don't have time to do the full thing of how we're doing. If we had time to do the full thing, we'd say what we really are, busy, busy. Busy, busy. It's a rise and grind culture. So commencements, that's what we praise. Go and work hard, achieve, go and do, and get wealth, get rich, earn. The second one that I think we really value over and above most others is fame. Fame. Young people at an increasing clip want to be famous. Like, this didn't happen in the 1700s. What do you want to do with your life? Be famous. No, you just wanted to work hard and eat. That's what you want to do. Nowadays, you want to be famous. There was a recent survey that had two out of three millennials thought their life was worthy of a biopic or reality show. And then you end up living up to that. Like, we live in a way where we think we are for those things. Think those things are for us. And then we have social media, which allows us to build an audience and to tailor a brand based on our persona. We chase the elusive blue check mark. I don't know if any of you know the blue check mark. Uh, we'll throw it up on the screen. The blue check mark, it's on Twitter, it's on Instagram. What this is, it's an account of public interest. In other words, if you own this account and you get a blue check mark, it means you're somebody. This check mark is a validation of being worth something. And we want it. We want it so bad. So we have wealth, we have fame, and then for others of us, it's achievement, skill, or this impetus to make a difference. I remember the Rubik's Cube got popular again. It was, I think, popular in the 70s, and it got popular again recently, and people would learn to solve it, and then that wasn't enough just solving it. Now we have to solve it faster and faster and faster and faster. Pretty soon you hate the Rubik's Cube, but you have to keep doing it faster and faster. That's the same way we are about whistling or whittling or writing or wandering. We have to do it the best. We have to do it better than everyone else. We have to signal virtue. We have to dig wells. We have to make deals. In the church context, we have to have a mission trip that's harder and more rigorous than your mission trip. It's all about like comparing these things to post, post, post. And subtly, what we post, post, post becomes boast, boast, boast. Look at me. Look at what I have achieved. I can do all things. Right? I can do all things. That's biblical. The Bible tells me I can do all things. Makes me think of Steph Curry's shoes. A picture of those. Steph Curry's shoes, uh, he has Philippians 4.13 on his shoes. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. There's a picture of him right there. Really awesome shoes, really awesome guy. Steph Curry is a great basketball player, seems like an even better human being. I think about if I could make the NBA, what verse would I throw on my shoes? 
because I think he took the best one. Like I could do John 3.16, but then I started thinking, I was like, you know what I'd want to do is like get weird with it. So I'd have like EX 2319s. You, you got the new EX 2319s and people would go buy them and they'd be $200 and they'd be like, what is EX 2319? Then they'd find out, oh, it's a Bible verse. It's Exodus 2319, which part of it reads, do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. And then people would be like, I spent $200 on this weirdo shoes? I, don't, I want the Stephs. Like, Stephs got it figured out. Philippians 4.13 are better because they're commencement worthy. That verse is commencement worthy verse. I can do all things. But you got to get into the context of what we're talking about when we say I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. It's the Apostle Paul talking in Philippians. During that time, you know what he was doing? He was under house arrest. He was wrongfully incarcerated, waiting to find out if he was going to be executed or not. And then if you go to the verse preceding that verse, it's about this. Uh, I know what it's like to be hungry and be poor. I can do all things. So the all that he's talking about in all things is to endure hunger, to be wrongfully incarcerated, and to possibly be executed. It's not making threes and making millions of dollars. And I'm not questioning Steph Curry's theology or getting onto him. I'm just saying what, what we're getting called to in Philippians isn't what we would term as good in our cultural context. It's actually the opposite of that that we're empowered to do. Recently, a meme went across, and I couldn't find the meme, but it had Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, and Dennis Rodman. And under Michael Jordan's name, it said, cut in high school, which isn't actually how the story goes, but there's a version of it that's kind of like that. And then for Scottie Pippen, it said, went to an NAIA school, which is a smaller college. And then for Dennis Rodman, it says, only recruited by a JUCO. And the point is that parents would then give this to their kid who got cut from the seventh grade team to say, hey, it's okay if you keep working hard, you keep grinding, you can be like these guys and you can make the NBA too. Problem is I'm a little bit of a cynic. And so what I did instantly when I saw that meme is I looked up their heights. Dennis Rodman, six foot seven. Scottie Pippen, six foot eight. Michael Jordan is the run of the litter at six foot six, but his vertical is 46 inches, which if you don't know what that means, if you looked at the person at your right, looked at the person at your left, and then all three of you jumped together and added it up, you wouldn't have Michael Jordan's vertical. These guys did work hard. These guys grinded. These guys pushed. These guys are also athletic specimens genetically. There's more likelihood of a six foot eight person making the NBA than the five foot 10 guy. That's just mathematics. So if I say I can do all things, I have to throw a caveat out there. I can do all things except play for the NBA. Because guess what? It's playoff season. I check my phone. They're not calling me. They want no part of me. I can't play in the NBA. There's a bunch of things I can't do, actually. And someone could hear me say that because it's non-commencement thinking and say, oh, you're such a downer. You're such a doubter. God could do it if he wanted. And that's the point of today. Does God want that? Like for me. Is that what we, we, we box God in, that he has to want that? Because what? It aligns with our cultural thinking. But is that actually what God wants? In the economy of God and his ecosystem, does he value the same things that I value? Wealth, fame, and achievement. Let's turn to a little bit of a biblical vantage. Take David. Remember David, he was the younger brother. He got anointed to be king. Then he went to take his brothers a pizza at the war front. And there's this giant named Goliath who's standing there challenging all of Israel to a battle that no one would take. David walks up there, slays Goliath, uh, takes all the accolade, and eventually takes the kingship. He's famous. He's famous. Okay, Joseph gets sold into slavery. He grinds his way through his life. He has great intellect. He ends up rising to be number two in the whole society and saves millions of people with savvy planning and good government. Or you take Esther. Esther stood up with courage and everything she had in her bag to save a people group from decimation. It was said of Esther, maybe you're called for such a time as this. And I bring those people up to to ask a question. How many Israelites can you name from the Exodus? So the book of Exodus, the Israelites escape from slavery, and they have a 40-year march to the promised land. Who can you name from that? Go ahead, give me a name. Who comes in your mind? Moses. About 74 people in here said Moses, because of course you said Moses. And who else? Joshua, Aaron. What's that? Caleb, okay, we start naming names, and if we get about six or seven deep, that's great. And then we get to like name eight, and it's like Bueller, Bueller. <laughs> like it's hard to come up with more names. Now, if you study the Exodus and it's in your Bible reading plan right now, you might have more in your bag. If you've studied, if you're a scholar of the Old but for most of us, we get a couple deep and our eyes go crossed. Here's the thing, and the reason I bring that up is because there was a million of them. And you don't get 40 people from one spot to another spot, a million of them with just Moses being great or Aaron doing good speeches. 
Or, or Caleb and Joshua being brave. Like, that's great, and they did their thing, and they should, but there's a bunch of people who aren't written about who are important, who are crucial, who are adjudicating laws, who are gathering food, who are cleaning babies, who are cleaning the temple. Like, these people were all important as well. There's only one David. In fact, there's only one Goliath. There's only one Joseph. There's only one Esther. And my point is this, that God uses people differently and his value system differs from the world. So you don't have to be David to be a successful Christian. Now, emulate David. There's things, there's a reason David is in there. We want to emulate David. I think David's in heaven right now, and he's not looking at me being like, what is he saying? He's probably like, thank goodness, because everyone keeps trying to be me, and that's the source of their discontent. Some of us, yeah, maybe you're David types. Most of us are not David types, and that is totally okay. God is not sad about that. If we all try to be David types, it won't work. Why? One, because we don't have the gifts. We have gifts, and they're different gifts. Not all of us are gifted to be alpha. Alpha leaders, royalty, kings, warriors, we're not all gifted that way, and that's okay. Second, if we all try to be David types, guess what we all do? We all vie for exactly the same things. How does that go? In fact, with David, one of the things that allowed him to be David is he showed up to the battlefront, and there was no queue waiting to fight Goliath. He got to jump right in there. If there had been thousands of people, the story might have gone completely different. The way God arranged it was so David could be David, precisely David, and walk in his own sandals, and other people could walk in theirs. The third reason we don't all have to be Davids or can't be, it might not be what God has for us individually. So you know what the perfect shoe verse is? Not EX 2319. I don't think Philippians 4, 13, the, the verse I want to put on my shoes, I want to put on my work boots that I want to look down and see every day is this verse. And it never gets talked about. 1 Thessalonians 4, 11. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Ambition, make it your strong goal, your aim, your trajectory, your desire. You should mind your business and work with your hands. And if you take work with your hands, because that can be a little bit confusing, Greek people thought it was like shameful to work with your hands. So this is God redeeming all the work, saying, no, you don't just all have to be kings and rulers and haughty and put your feet up, and you don't all have to be white collar. Like, no, jobs are jobs, do them well. Make it your ambition, your goal, to be quiet and work hard. What a verse. That's not what entertainment TV tells me or Twitter or commencement speeches tell me. It sounds otherworldly precisely because it is otherworldly. I was talking the other day to a stay-at-home mother, and she had this lament. She said, I feel like I'm doing nothing with my life. I'm just a stay-at-home mom. And this is what many of us do. I'm just an accountant. I'm just a dad. I'm just a good neighbor. I'm just a retiree. And what we need to do is cancel the just and add to the end, praise God. I'm an accountant, praise God. I'm a dad, praise God. I'm a good neighbor, praise God. I'm a retiree, praise God. I'm a stay-at-home God, praise God. That is a good thing. Let's think about God himself. You know what the most radical thing that God does is? Redeem sinners. Okay, you could throw that one out. So maybe the second most, all right? The most radical thing God does day in and day out is day in and day out. Think about it. Since the dawn of time, the sun rises the exact same way at the exact same time, pretty much, and sets the exact same way at the exact same time, pretty much. We have the same slated number of daytime hours as nighttime hours. It's predictable. It's like clockwork. In fact, it is why we have clockwork. God is not easily bored. Think if God one day was like, ooh, I think I'll do a purple sun today. It would mess us all up. But he's like, ah, oh, I did that for a couple thousand years. I'm going to try something new. No, God does it the same way every day. The yellow sun rising is a beautiful expression of an unwavering God who is not bored with the ordinary. And he's not bored with your life. God isn't looking for pomp and circumstances. He is looking for faithfulness and holiness. That's the repeated call in scripture, whether we're talking about David or some unnamed Israelite. It's all about faithfulness and holiness. And that's repeated for our lives too, whether we're draining threes and making millions and signing book deals or just cleaning up messes and changing diapers. We have this in the Bible too, like Job. He was just suffering. His life went off the rails. It wasn't good. He wasn't winning. He wasn't wearing like the best shoes, the fanciest shoes. People didn't want to be anywhere near Job because things were going so bad. And what's the lesson for Job? Trust God and be faithful. 
Solomon, who did have all the wealth in the world, he wrote a book called Ecclesiastes, which you could summarize and say, wealth is meaningless, life is really hard, make some good friends, try and enjoy it, and trust God. That's like the point of Ecclesiastes. That's like Solomon after thinking and living and grinding and having wealth and fame and all this stuff. That's what he comes as like, this is the most important thing. John the Baptist, he was like the mega church pastor. Thousands of people would come and listen to him. He had the strategically located tattoo. He was up on stage. Flocks would come. And you know what he said? He said, let me decrease so that you can increase. He stepped down from his position because he wanted to step up into the glory of God. Or Jesus. We're told there's nothing extraordinary about the appearance of Jesus. We're told that Jesus was poor. And we say, well, Jesus was famous. No, Jesus was infamous. Crowds came to kill him. But we somehow forget those and we go back to being like uh, John and James's mom. They were disciples of Jesus, and they came up, it's like calling the coach for playtime. They came up to Jesus and said, hey, my boys are pretty cool. Can they sit at the right and left and rule? Can they be the top dogs? Can they have this achievement? She was having commencement thinking. Jesus is like, oh, what about all that stuff about, you know, the first will be last? We forget it. And when we chase a checkmark life of disrag dreams, some wonderful virtues get twisted toward terrible vices. And we end up living in a cage of our own making trying to keep up with some kind of spiritual Joneses, some kind of physical Joneses. We try and keep up with all these things. And the Bible tells us we don't have to. We have been freed. It is for freedom we've been set free to abundant life. I found once uh, in my parents' garage some ankle weights. I don't know. I guess from when my dad played sports, I was like 10 years old, and I was like, oh, this is great. And I put them on and wore them all day because I had a baseball game that night. It's like, if I wear these all day, I'm going to be super fast tonight. It's going to be amazing, which is actually pretty heady play for a 10-year-old. That's good thinking. But it doesn't work if I forget to take them off. And that's what we do with our life, right? We forget to take the weights off, and we're lumbering around under weights that we don't have to carry anymore. And when we do that, a few things happen. So I'll go three of these things that happen. The first one is disillusionment and discontent. We end up having this disdain and restlessness for the ordinary. Here's a, a... Fake newspaper headline. We'll throw it up there. Unambitious loser with happy, fulfilling life still lives in hometown. This is from The Onion, so it's parody. It's not real, but some quotes from this. I thought it was funny. It's about four pages long. I'll just do a few quotes. It says, Longtime acquaintances confirmed to reporters this week that local man Michael Husmer, an unambitious 29-year-old loser who leads an enjoyable and fulfilling life, still lives in his hometown and has no desire to leave. Uh... One of his friends says this, I've known Mikey my whole life, and he's a good guy, but it's pretty pathetic he's still living on the same street he grew up on, experiencing a deep sense of personal satisfaction. (laughs) As soon as Mike graduated from college, he moved back home and started working at a local insurance firm. Now he's nearly 30 years old, living in the exact same town he was born in, and working at the same small town job, and is extremely contented in all aspects of his home and professional lives. It's really sad. I don't know how anyone could let themselves end up like that, said Gorman but he seems perfectly fine being nothing more than a genuinely happy deadbeat for the rest of his life. Former classmates also confirm that the underachiever is apparently resigned to doing his little, small-time, stable, extremely fulfilling job in town each day and has zero ambitions to leave his position and pursue a more prestigious and soul-crushing career path in in a real city. According to relatives who moved thousands of miles away and are currently alienated from much of the family, Husmer has never once taken a major professional or financial risk, choosing instead to coast through life by putting considerable time and effort into his rewarding marriage, playing an active role in his two children's lives, and being sincerely thankful for what he has in this world. What a loser. <laughs> like, that's parody, and it's not real, but isn't it real? Like, we have this thing where it's like, well, if you don't go big enough, and, you've not, and we have this disillusionment that happens with that. There, here's a lie that we tell ourselves. If I blank, then I'll be enough. And if we say that and we're a believer, we've lost sight of God. But rest assured, he has not, not lost sight of you. Somehow we serve this God who is fascinated with you. Who fearfully and wonderfully made you and is delighted by your most mundane Monday. It's a wonderful thing. But when we live that lie, if I blank, then I'll be enough, what happens is it stagnates us. It it deadens our dreams and it dampens our desires. I had this immense moment of clarity at the end of my collegiate career. I I was an English major and my goal was to write the great American novel because again, you could say that and it would impress adults. 
And so as an English major, I got to read a bunch of great American novels. And I remember my last semester in college, I finished this one book. I was sitting in a lawn chair when I finished it. It was for class. And I started tearing up at the end of it for a couple reasons. The first reason, I was sad it was over because it was such a good book. It was East of Eden by John Steinbeck. The second reason I started tearing up is because I realized in that moment that I would never write anything nearly as good as that. I had this awareness of this immense talent gap, this natural gifting gap between John Steinbeck and me. So the third reason I was tearing up is because it mean I was discarding a dream. And so I thought about what this would cost me as I got rid of this dream that I had to write the great American novel. And you know what it cost me? Sitting next to David Letterman as he interviewed me about my bestseller. And then I had this other wave, this other vision of like the second time I was interviewed by David Letterman with my second bestseller. And what I realized is somewhere I had liked writing and I transferred that out for the dream of fame. I wasn't any longer doing a passion that I was passionate about for the sake of the passion, the sake of other people sharing in that passion. I was doing a thing to make myself rich and famous. This dilution, it's subtle, but it's toxic, had happened. God wants your heart, and then he craves your freedom, and then he wants you to have delight in your life. So here's a true commencement guarantee, and you got to listen to all of it, but a true commencement guarantee for you. Be faithful where you are called today, and it will lead to more. Even if that more is just an enlivened, joyous heart amid unchanging circumstances. A lot of times we hear, man, just be content and it'll lead to more. Do a good job and it'll lead to more. It may not, but it could lead to a heart that has more in it, a heart that is content. And a heart that has content isn't less, ever. It will lead to more. It's truly a nevertheless that when we have a contented heart, no matter what our circumstances are, we have a better life, a life of delight. Disillusionment and discontent, that's what it leads us in. Another thing it leads us in is envy and jealousy. When we have this kind of cultural commencement thinking, envy and jealousy, that we all want the same things. It's like Thanksgiving when they make one pie and have 30 people over. It doesn't go well. There's only so much of it to go around. And when you live as a failure for not writing a bestseller, what happens subtly is you begin to hate everyone who writes a single word. When you live as a failure for not being the executive, you hate everyone who is. You hate everyone who gets a promotion. You live as a failure for being someone who stays home with the kids. You hate everyone who's employed. Like all of a sudden we start like having this like toxic thing happen to ourselves. And we end up wanting what we don't actually want simply because someone else has it. Instead of wanting what is best. Wanting what is for you. Ephesians 2.10 said that God laid out things in advance for us to walk in. He's got this beautiful plan for you. Whether the world applauds it as beautiful or not, it doesn't matter because God does. He's applauding it as beautiful and for you. Instead, we have these weaponized, embittered souls. We need to cast that away. I have a prayer to do such. It's from Scripture. It's made up. Maybe you remember it. There's five parts of this prayer. I pray that I can lead a quiet life, work hard as if for the Lord, strive for excellence for your glory, love God, love people. When I start feeling envy and jealousy, that's my prayer. Lead a quiet life, work hard for the Lord, strive for excellence for your glory, love God, love people. Oh, contentment will swell when I do that. And it'll push out the toxic, the poison of performance. Disillusionment, discontent, envy, and jealousy. The third one is super dangerous because it's very cloaked. It's vicarious victory. What happened is, like in that example of me with Steinbeck, we have age or we have time and we don't have enough time to do the things we wanted to do when we were young, or we realize there's a talent gap and we actually can't fulfill and carry through the thing that we so dreamed of doing. And then, as Twain would say, we throw up the sponge. We throw in the towel on whatever that dream is, and then we foist it onto someone else. Like Genesis 3, when humans fall, it's Adam and Eve not being content in their station of life. They got bored with paradise and wanted something more, and all of humanity fell. And so what we do when we like kind of punt on this dream is we didn't get someone else to go take the forbidden fruit for us, hoping that we can like reap the benefits of their spoil. Uh, what do I mean? Well, we love our kids at a price. Did you make the dean's list? What major are you pursuing? How much are you making? Did you score a hat trick? Vicariously, we're trying to make little stars of our kids where our star faded. 
Again, it's that commencement thinking, or in churches, and this one's hard, but churches, we do this all the time. What we do with churches is we end up anointing kings. I can't start the revival. I can't say the right words. I can't build this movement. I can't do all these things, but my gold star pastor can. My favorite speaker, my favorite leader, my favorite singer, and the Old Testament is explicit about this. The king making doesn't go well. Read the Old Testament. A sub-theme of the Old Testament is where there's a king, there is corruption. We don't need this mediator of approval between us and God. God approves of us. He loves us where we are, and he won't leave us where we are. In churches, we crown kings and rejoice not in the Lord, but in the shared spoils of idolatrous conquest. And we make relics out of faithfulness and holiness. Instead of just clinging to faithfulness and holiness, that is what we're made for. In commencement speeches, you aren't supposed to end with a bunch of negatives, so here are three positives that we can go against the grain on. The first thing we need to do, encourage gifts. Encourage gifts. In others, that someone's doing a great thing and stewarding the gift that God has given them, applaud that, encourage that. Not the person, but like the fact that God has given something and they're giving it away, that's a beautiful picture. But then also encourage gifts in yourself. Because they're yours does not mean they're less. Your gifts are good gifts, and every good and perfect gift is from above. Just a painter, just a friend, just a carer, just a mom? No, you are an ambassador on a sacred mission. Changing the diaper is epic. We encourage gifts. We also embrace calling. You want a better life? Starting today on, embrace calling. Live like you are called to what is in front of you. So you're a stay-at-home parent? No, you're a divine participator. Your custodian, your divine participator. Your accountant, your divine participator. Entrepreneur, divine participator. Student, divine participator. Dentist, repent. <laughs> Not really. Like, dentists are cool. I like dentists. Just don't ask me like open-ended questions when you're up to the elbows in my mouth. That's the only thing I would say. But no, you're a divine participator too. The point is, be precisely awesome where you are. Obey. Breathe, love, and rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Encourage gifts. Embrace calling. Third, engage a counter-cultural mindset. Think of a whole church who had this as their commencement values, where everyone in the church is seen and known. Everyone. Where everyone in the church is supported where everyone is empowered, no matter how small the gift seems to our human eyes, we realize that God sees it as huge and magnified and important. Where everyone is kind, not just kind to the people who they, they admire, not just kind to the people who have the in gifts, where we function as a body, where every part is crucial and cared for and called. And like today, I'm wearing a microphone. That just means I'm amplified, my voice is. I am no more called today than you are. The Bible's clear on that too. There are people who are anointed to be teachers and speakers and then just as anointed are people who are called to be hearers and listeners. And it's a symbiotic relationship. It's always supposed to be. And all of our gifts, we use the gifts to serve one another, whatever our gifts are. There's a story about a church who, uh, they're getting ready to have a service and none of their stuff worked. They had a big room and they had all these like instruments and stuff and none of them would work. And someone came up to the person speaking that day and said, hey, if the microphone doesn't work, are you prepared to shout your talk? And what I love about the story is that it was today at this church. (laughs) We are 40 minutes away from the service and nothing worked. And there's this beautiful picture of the body of Christ and that the people who knew how to do things with wires were doing things with wires. And the people who didn't know how to do things with wires were staying out of the way of the people who knew how to do things with wires. And everyone was grinding, but at no point were we like, well, Let's throw it up because it can't be as good. It can't be as culturally relevant. It's not going to be as pithy. It's not going to be as production quality. No, they said, can you shout your talk? And I love that because I thought about shout to the Lord. That's the picture of faithfulness. That no matter how it goes with our church, no matter how it goes with our lives, our God is good and faithful and he's redeeming all things. Think about being a sun rising, beautiful people that are holy and faithful. Like each day, God makes all things new. And he may well be choosing to do that through your most mundane Monday, your extraordinarily ordinary life. 
your ambition to quietly pursue excellence and faithfulness and holiness. C.S. Lewis has a children's book. I think it's in A Horse and His Boy. But there's one character complaining about another character. And they're talking to the God figure who's this lion named Aslan. And so the one character is like, why does so-and-so have it so easy? So-and-so is in the royal family. So-and-so has wealth. So-and-so didn't get attacked by an animal like I got attacked by an animal. So-and-so hasn't had to work for everything like I've had to work for everything. Why is it this way? And the lion quietly and lovingly says, stop it. Your story is your story. Your story is your own. And that's how it is for each of you today. God delighted in giving you your own story. What are you going to do with it? Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this day. We thank you for each of these people here. I pray that we could lead a quiet life, that we could work hard as if for the Lord, that we could strive for excellence for your glory, that we could love you and that we could love your people. Let us be humble. Let us steward our gifts well. And let us praise God for what we do have. Let's praise God for what he is doing. Let us rejoice in the Lord always, even in the hard times, even when no one's noticing, even when the world isn't applauding us. That's the true commencement that we are on this fantastic, eternal, cosmic journey. But God's value system is different. And he's looking on with us in love. No matter how simple or quiet or trite our life seems, he is fascinated by us. He's fascinated by you. Let us bask in that and let us leave well. Let us love well. In Jesus' name, amen. And then sing with us, please. Great this love. Oh, it's moving on my mountain. This perfect love is casting out my fear. How great this love. Oh, it welcomes me like family. Anywhere I go.
felt that today. We hope that you're encouraged, and I just pray that you guys have a fabulous week, and we will see you next week. Take care.